The first mechatronic essential concept is angular velocity of a rigid body. The motivation for this concept comes from current events. The SpaceX rocket landing on a platform in the middle of the ocean, the Mars rover Perseverance landing on the Mars surface, packages being delivered by drones, parts being scanned three-dimensionally for tolerances, and motorcycle dynamics all require a three-dimensional approach to dynamic analysis. What is the state of dynamics education? Dynamics is a course taught in the sophomore year of an engineering curriculum. It covers particle motion, kinematics and kinetics in 2D and 3D applications, but rigid body kinematics and kinetics are only studied in planar or 2D applications. Three-dimensional concepts are not discussed. Dynamics is a required course in a mechanical curriculum. Students in other disciplines may also take dynamics. The questions asked in a dynamics course are to find instantaneous properties. For example, find velocity or acceleration at a point, or find the force or torque at an instant in time. This falls short of what industry demands. Industry demands three-dimensional kinematics and kinetics, the study of rigid bodies in three-dimensional motion. Industry also demands an integration among the disciplines. Mechanical engineers are the experts in dynamics, but electrical, civil, and biomedical engineers must be knowledgeable in dynamics applied to two-dimensional and three-dimensional applications. And lastly, knowledge about the entire motion of the dynamic system through the solution of the nonlinear equations of motion using Simulink or Simscape. That is what industry demands. That is what industry requires. And as you can see, there is a chasm between what is currently taught in undergraduate engineering dynamics and what industry demands from graduating engineers. The first mechatronic essential concept is angular velocity of a rigid body. Ask any engineer what the velocity of a point on a rigid body is, and they will correctly say that it is the time rate of change of a linear position vector. Ask any engineer what angular velocity is, and they most likely will incorrectly say that it is the time rate of change of an angular position vector. And in both cases, there is usually no mention of the reference frames involved. The misunderstanding of angular velocity and the ambiguity that imprecise notation creates can lead to errors resulting in lost time and money and even tragic results. What is the difference between a particle and a rigid body. A particle is a body of negligible dimensions. It's very small. Also, when the dimensions of a body are irrelevant to the description of its motion or the action of the forces acting on it, the body may be treated as a particle, no matter how large it is. It can also be defined as a rigid body that does not change its orientation. It only translates. So the techniques for studying particle motion in two dimensions and three dimensions are the same when studying a rigid body in rectilinear or curvilinear translation. What is a rigid body? A rigid body is a body whose changes in shape are negligible compared with the overall dimensions of the body or with the changes in position of the body as a whole. So if you're studying the motion of an airplane as it flies from New York to Los Angeles, 
and you're only concerned about the path that it follows during that flight, the airplane can be treated as a particle. If you're interested in the change in orientation of the airplane as it flies from New York to Los Angeles, the airplane must be treated as a rigid body. And if you're interested in how the airplane deforms, how the wings bend during that flight, then a rigid body assumption is no longer valid. Position, velocity, and acceleration of a particle. In the diagram, you see a XYZ coordinate system. It is my reference frame, which I call the R reference frame. Particle P is moving along the path shown. The position vector of particle P with respect to the XYZ reference frame, the R reference frame, is given by the vector R at time t. In time delta t, the particle moves from position P to position P1, and the vector from position P to P1 is given as delta R, and it's a vector. If I take the limit as time goes to zero of the quotient of delta R divided by delta T, the result is what we call the derivative of R with respect to time in the R reference frame. And this is the definition of the velocity of particle P in the R reference frame. If I take the derivative of the velocity of P in the R reference frame, and I take that derivative in the R reference frame, the result is the acceleration of P in the R reference frame. And this also can be represented as the second derivative of R with respect to time taken in the R reference frame. The position, velocity, and acceleration of a point on a rigid body are defined only with respect to a specified reference frame. Be clear in specifying the reference frame used in each kinematic description. Positions, velocities, and accelerations are vectors. They can be represented by directed line segments and can be combined or decomposed according to the laws of vector algebra. Linear momentum of a particle. Linear momentum P, and it's a vector, of a particle is defined as the product of the mass and the velocity of the particle. P, the vector P, linear momentum, is equal to the mass times the velocity, and velocity is a vector. This is the constitutive relationship governing the particle of mass M. By Newton's second law, the resultant force F, a vector, acting on the particle is given as the derivative of the linear momentum vector with respect to time taken in the R reference frame. And that R reference frame is an inertial reference frame. This is the force dynamic relationship governing the particle. The linear momentum is absolute and the derivative is taken with respect to the inertial reference frame, here designated as reference frame R. Notation and reference frames. A reference frame is a perspective from which observations are made regarding the motion of a system. A moving body, such as an automobile or airplane, frequently provides a useful reference frame for our observations of motion. Even when we are not moving, it is often easier to describe the motion of a point by reference to a moving object. This is the case for many common machines, 
such as linkages. An engineer needs to be able to correlate observations of position, velocity, and acceleration of points on moving bodies, as well as the angular velocities and angular accelerations of those moving bodies from both fixed and moving reference frames. Without a reference frame, neither motion nor dynamics make sense. Experience has shown that, in the absence of relativistic effects, the mass of a particle and the force applied to a particle do not depend on the reference frame with respect to which they are measured. Yet, the value of the derivative of the linear momentum vector with respect to time does depend on the reference frame from which the motion is observed. There are only some reference frames in which the applied force to the particle equals the derivative of the linear momentum vector with respect to time. And these are called inertial reference frames. The linear momentum of a particle as seen from different inertial reference frames can differ at most by a constant. So the velocity of a particle as seen from two inertial reference frames must also differ at most by a constant. Any two inertial reference frames are at most moving relative to each other with a constant velocity. Thus, an inertial reference frame is a non-accelerating, whether due to translation or rotation, reference frame. Angular momentum of a particle. Here we present an alternative form of Newton's second law. There is no new dynamic information presented. Angular momentum is the moment of linear momentum about a point. In the diagram, O, X, Y, Z is an inertial reference frame. B is an arbitrary point. The particle has a mass M. The externally applied force to the particle of mass m is f, and p is the linear momentum of the particle. r is the position vector of the particle with respect to O. r sub b is the position vector of point b with respect to O. Small r is the position vector of the particle with respect to point b. Using my vector triangle, I see that R is equal to R sub B plus R. The vector R is equal to the vector R sub B plus the vector small r. I also see that the absolute velocity of the particle, that is the velocity of the particle with respect to the inertial reference frame is given as dr dt. And all derivatives in this example are derivatives with respect to the inertial reference frame. So velocity v is the absolute velocity of the particle of mass m. The velocity of arbitrary point b in the inertial reference frame is the derivative with respect to time of the vector r sub b. We know from Newton's second law that the externally applied force f is equal to the derivative with respect to time of the linear momentum, where the linear momentum of the particle is mass times velocity. So if I take the cross product of both sides of this equation using the position vector r, r cross f is the torque or moment of the force acting on the particle of mass m about the arbitrary point b, and the moment of the linear momentum about the arbitrary point b is r cross dp dt. Now using the product rule, I can represent r cross dp dt 
as the derivative of the cross product r cross p minus the derivative of r with respect to time cross p. And that is a result of the product rule. I could write this expression then carrying the derivative of r cross p down to the next line, but replacing small r using this vector equation, small r is equal to capital R minus capital R sub b. I've made that substitution here. And that sum then gets crossed with the linear momentum vector p. On the next line, I bring down the derivative of r cross p, but I realize that dr dt is the velocity of the particle, and since the velocity of the particle cross with the linear momentum, which is mass times the velocity of the particle, is zero. So that can be eliminated. So the result then is that the derivative of r cross p, and r cross p, by definition, is my angular momentum. So the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time, with the derivative taken in the grounded reference frame, is shown here. And then I have the additional term plus, because a minus and a minus gives me a plus, the absolute velocity of the point B cross with the linear momentum. And R cross F, the moment of the force applied to the particle of mass M about point B is called the torque of the force F about point B. The resulting equation then says that the torque of the force acting on the particle of mass M about point B is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum of the particle with respect to point B, with the derivative taken in the grounded reference frame, plus the absolute velocity of point B cross with the linear momentum of the particle of mass M. When does that term, the velocity of B, cross with the linear momentum p equals zero? Well, certainly if the velocity of b is zero, so if the point b is fixed in the inertial reference frame, then the absolute velocity of point b is equal to zero. Or if the velocity of point b is parallel to the linear momentum, that is parallel to the velocity of particle p, then that cross product equals zero. So if either of these conditions hold, then the torque or the moment of the force F acting on the particle about arbitrary point B is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum of the particle about point B with that derivative taken in the absolute frame of reference. So whenever point B is either fixed or a point that moves parallel to the particle, the resultant torque applied to the particle equals the time rate of change of the particle's angular momentum. And this is called the angular momentum principle or the moment of momentum principle. Conservation theorems. The analysis of many problems in dynamics can be achieved in the form of conservation theorems. In general, conservation theorems specify the conditions under which one or more quantities remain constant in time. The conservation of linear momentum of a particle theorem states that if the resultant force on a particle is zero, then by Newton's second law, the derivative of the linear momentum with respect to time is also zero, and the particle's linear momentum is conserved. That is, 
the linear momentum remains constant. Similarly, the conservation of angular momentum of a particle theorem states that if V is either fixed or moves with a velocity parallel to the velocity of the particle, then this equation holds. And if the resultant torque about point B equals zero, then the derivative of the angular momentum of the particle with respect to point B also is zero. So the angular momentum of the particle with respect to point B is conserved. That is, the angular momentum of the particle with respect to point B remains constant. These conservation theorems are not laws. They are a direct consequence of Newton's second law. In 1830, Michel Chazels proposed the following theorem. The most general motion of a rigid body is equivalent to a translation of some point, which may be inside or outside the body, plus a rotation about an axis passing through that point. This theorem is valid for the general motion of any rigid body in three-dimensional space. Here I demonstrate the theorem for planar motion. Here is a wheel in general plane motion. A line painted on the wheel not only translates, but rotates. There's a translation and a change in orientation of the wheel. This can be viewed as the sum of a translation where, where the line moves from A1, B1 to A2, B1 prime. There's no change in orientation of the wheel. It's a pure translation. To this is then added a rotation about an axis through the point A2 perpendicular to the plane of motion. So the line rotates from its original vertical position to this new position. B1 prime moves to position B2. In the diagram below, we see the same situation. We have a rigid body in general plane motion. The line painted on the body, line A1, B1, can be viewed as first translating with no change in orientation to the line A2, B1 prime. And this is followed then by a rotation about an axis, a fixed axis, perpendicular to the plane of motion through point A2, where B1 prime moves to position B2. Finite rotations. If a point P undergoes several linear displacements in succession, the resulting total linear displacement can be represented by a directed line segment that is the vector sum of the directed line segments that represent the individual displacements. However, when a finite body undergoes several finite angular displacements about different axes in succession, the result depends on the order in which the individual angular displacements are taken. So even though finite angular displacements can be, re be represented by directed line segments, in general, the combination of these directed line segments does not satisfy the laws of vector algebra. The exception is the case for plane motion, where all the angular displacements are about the same axis. To illustrate this, I show an XYZ coordinate system. If I first rotate 90 degrees about the Z axis, then the X axis will rotate towards the Y axis. If I follow that by a 90 degree rotation about the X axis, then the Y axis will rotate towards the Z axis. The result of the two rotations is shown here. If I now reverse the order of the rotations, and I first rotate 90 degrees about the x-axis, the y-axis will rotate towards the z-axis. 
If I then rotate 90 degrees about the z-axis, the x-axis will rotate towards the y-axis. The result of these two rotations is shown here. Clearly, the results are different. However, infinitesimal angular displacements do obey the laws of vector addition. So it follows that angular velocities also satisfy the laws of vector addition. So the order for angular velocities does not make any difference. They can be summed in any order because infinitesimal angular displacements do obey the laws of vector addition. Angular velocity of a rigid body. R is the ground reference frame with coordinate axes x, y, z fixed in R. Here I show the coordinate axes x, y, z with unit vectors i hat, j hat, and k hat. This represents the R reference frame, the ground reference frame. The x, y, z axes are fixed in R. The origin of the coordinate axes is point O. The R1 reference frame is a rigid body moving in reference frame R with coordinate axes x1, y1, z1 fixed in R1. Here is a rigid body moving in the ground reference frame R in three-dimensional motion. And to this rigid body, I attach the coordinate axes x1, y1, z1 fixed in the rigid body with unit vectors i1 hat, j1 hat, and k1 hat fixed in the rigid body. The rigid body reference frame is R1. The origin of the coordinate axes is point A. Beta is any vector fixed in R1. This vector beta has a magnitude and a direction, and it's fixed in R1. So if you are in the R1 reference frame, you see the vector beta as having a constant magnitude and a constant direction, which does not change as the rigid body moves. I1 hat, J1 hat, and K1 hat form a right-handed set of mutually perpendicular unit vectors fixed in R1, as we have shown here. The angular velocity is the time rate of change of orientation of the body. And we define it using the definition of the time rate of change of the vector beta as viewed from the ground reference frame. So the derivative of the vector beta with respect to time as viewed from the ground reference frame is equal to the cross product of the angular velocity of the R1 reference frame as viewed from the R reference frame crossed with the vector beta. This is the defining equation for angular velocity. And we see angular velocity is not in general equal to the derivative of any single vector. Here is an expression which is never used but is the defining equation for the angular velocity of R1 and R in terms of the unit vectors fixed in R1, I1 hat, J1 hat, and K1 hat, and their derivatives with respect to the grounded reference frame. We have seen that the angular velocity of a rigid body is the rate of change of orientation of the rigid body. So where does the idea that angular velocity is the rate of change of some angle? Well, it comes from planar motion of a rigid body. When a rigid body moves in a plane, say the xy plane, any change of orientation of the rigid body is a rotation about the z-axis, perpendicular to the plane of motion, perpendicular to the xy plane. So the rate of change of orientation of a rigid body in plane motion 
is the time derivative of the angle that the rigid body makes about the z-axis. This is called simple angular velocity of a rigid body, and it occurs in plane motion of a rigid body. Let's formally define what we mean by simple angular velocity. When a rigid body R1 moves in a reference frame R in such a way that there exists throughout some time interval a unit vector whose orientation in both R1 and R is independent of time, then rigid body R1 is said to have simple angular velocity in R throughout this time interval. Let's look at a three-dimensional example. R represents the ground reference frame. Attached to R is a shaft which rotates and has a reference frame we'll call R1. At the end of the shaft, rotating with the shaft, is a clevis attachment. A disc is mounted in this clevis attachment, and it also rotates. So we see that the angular velocity of R1 in R, R1 is the shaft, R is ground, since the z-axis k hat in the R reference frame and the z-axis k1 hat in the R1 reference frame are parallel throughout all of the motion of this dynamic system, we have simple angular velocity. So the angle of velocity of R1 and R is directed in the k hat direction, which is the same as the k1 hat direction, and has a magnitude equal to the time rate of change of an angle, here theta dot. Theta dot then is the angular speed of R1 in R. So we see here that R1 has simple angular velocity in R, and we call it here on the diagram omega 1, and R2 has simple angular velocity in R1, and we call that here on the diagram omega 2. But R2 does not have simple angular velocity in reference frame R. In the three-dimensional example shown, R is the grounded reference frame, R1 is the rotating shaft, and R2 is the disk. R1 has simple angular velocity in R because this axis attached to R1 and R remain parallel throughout the motion. R2 has simple angular velocity in R1 because this axis in both R1 and R2 remain parallel throughout the motion. However, R2 does not have simple angular velocity in R, as there is no axis in R and R2 that remains parallel to each other throughout the motion. So the angular velocity of R2 and R1 is simple angular velocity. The angular velocity of R1 and R is simple angular velocity, but the angular velocity of R2 and R is not simple angular velocity. So how do we obtain the angular velocity of R2 and R? Well, there's a very powerful theorem in kinematics called the addition theorem for angular velocity. And it says here that the angular velocity of R2 and R is the angular velocity of R1 in R plus the angular velocity of R2 in R1. More generally stated, it is shown here. The angular velocity of Rn in R is the angular velocity of R1 in R plus the angular velocity of R2 in R1. And then we continue until we get to the angular velocity of Rn in R n minus 1. The addition theorem for angular velocity allows us to obtain complex angular velocities by simply summing simple angular velocities, as shown in this example. 
Another important theorem in kinematics is the differentiation of a vector in two reference frames. Here, R is the grounded reference frame. The XYZ coordinate system is fixed to ground. R1 is a reference frame fixed to the rigid body that's moving in space. The X1, Y1, Z1 coordinate system is fixed to that body. It's fixed to the R1 reference frame. Beta is a vector with a certain magnitude and direction that is neither fixed in R nor is it fixed in R1. If you are in the R reference frame and you're looking at beta and you want to determine its derivative with respect to time, that will be much different than if you were in R1, moving with R1, fixed to R1, and viewing beta, and determining its derivative with respect to time. How are these two observations related? Well, they're related through this theorem. This theorem says that the derivative of the vector beta with respect to time, as viewed in the R reference frame, is equal to the derivative of beta with respect to time as viewed in the R1 reference frame plus the angular velocity of R1 with respect to R crossed, that's the vector cross product, with the vector beta. A very important theorem, a very useful theorem in dynamics. Here is a formal statement of the addition theorem for angular velocities. Consider multiple reference frames, R1, R2, to R sub n. The following relation applies. Whether the angular velocities are simple or not, the angular velocity of R sub n in R is equal to the angular velocity of R1 in R, plus the angular velocity of R2 and R1, plus, and we continue until we get to the end, the angular velocity of Rn in Rn minus 1. So it's important to realize that any of these angular velocities can be simple or not. But the usefulness in this theorem is that typically each of these individual angular velocities are simple angular velocities and can be determined by inspection. And they are the rate of change of some angle. But the complex angular velocity we're looking to determine is determined by this addition. There exists at any one instant only one angular velocity of r sub n in r. Also note, that the angular velocity of r sub n in r is equal to the opposite, the inverse, the minus of the angular velocity of r in r sub n. This addition theorem is very powerful as it allows one to develop an expression for a complicated angular velocity by using intermediate reference frames, real or fictitious, that have simple angular velocity relations between each of them. Important note here is that the reference frames can be real or they can be fictitious. You can create fictitious reference frames that have simple angular velocities between them so as to determine the complex angular velocity using this addition theorem for angular velocities. You will come across examples of this in your dynamics work. How do we determine the angular acceleration of a rigid body? Well, the angular acceleration of reference frame R1 and reference frame R is given by the following equation. We use alpha to represent angular acceleration. This is the angular acceleration vector of reference frame R1 in reference frame R. To obtain that, we take the derivative with respect to time of the angular velocity of R1 
in R. And we can take that derivative either in the R reference frame or the R1 reference frame. We get the same result. However, there is no addition theorem for angular accelerations. Please do not make that mistake. There is an addition theorem for angular velocities, but there is no addition theorem for angular accelerations. When we have simple angular velocity, for example, the simple angular velocity of R1 in R, then there is a unit vector in R, say k hat, and a unit vector in R1, say k1 hat, that stays parallel they stay parallel to each other during the motion. In that case, we have simple angular velocity. The angular velocity of R1 and R can be written as its magnitude times the unit vector k hat. The angular acceleration of R1 and R can be written as its magnitude times k hat where for simple angular velocity, the angular velocity omega is equal to the time rate of change of an angle, in this case theta, so it's theta dot, and alpha, the angular acceleration, is equal to the time derivative of omega, which is equal to theta double dot. So simple angular velocity is the time derivative of an angle. And the angular acceleration is simply the derivative again of that angle. So it's the second derivative here of theta with respect to time. When we have simple angular velocity, the situation is very simple and straightforward. However, the world is full of three-dimensional applications and so the determination of the angular acceleration of one reference frame in another is usually a complicated calculation. Velocity and acceleration of a point. The solution of nearly every problem in dynamics requires the formulation of expressions for velocities and accelerations of points of a system under consideration. The diagram shows a grounded reference frame, the R reference frame, with coordinate axes X, Y, and Z, and origin O. The R1 reference frame is a rigid body in space motion, translating and rotating. Its coordinate axes are X1, Y1, and Z1, with origin at point A. Point P is a point with arbitrary motion in space. I want to determine the velocity of P as viewed in the R reference frame and the acceleration of P as viewed in the R reference frame. Both of these equations are easily derivable. However, we do not want to focus on the derivations, but focus on the physical meaning of each term. Let's start with velocity. The velocity of P in the R reference frame is equal to the velocity of A in the R reference frame. The second term, which will be called tangential velocity, is the velocity you would see if you were at A, translating with the rigid body, but not rotating with the rigid body, and you looked at point P, and at that instant, you froze that point P in the R1 reference frame. Its velocity would be given by this expression, tangential velocity R omega. The last term is the velocity of P in R1. That's the velocity you would see if you were at A, translating with the rigid body, and also rotating with the rigid body, and then determining the velocity of P as it goes through its motion. This then, the combination of these three terms, gives us the velocity of P as seen from an observer 
in the R reference frame. Consider acceleration. The acceleration of P in the R reference frame is equal to the acceleration of A in the R reference frame. The next two terms are called centripetal acceleration and tangential acceleration. If you are at point A, translating with the rigid body, not rotating with the rigid body, you looked at point P, at that instant in time, you froze point P in the R1 reference frame and determined its acceleration, what you would see is R omega squared, the centripetal acceleration, and R alpha, the tangential acceleration. Next, if you are at point A, translating and rotating with the rigid body, and you look at point P and determine its acceleration, you would see the acceleration of P in R1. This is called relative acceleration. However, there's an additional term that is unexpected, and it's called Coriolis acceleration. And we only have Coriolis acceleration when P is moving with respect to the R1 reference frame. That is, it has a velocity in the R1 reference frame. The example we will consider next will explain clearly what centripetal acceleration is and what Coriolis acceleration is. Anatomy of Coriolis and centripetal acceleration. Here is an example to help you understand Coriolis and centripetal acceleration. A turntable with its center pivot O fixed to ground is rotating clockwise at a constant angular rate. The R reference frame is the XY coordinate system shown here. The Z axis is perpendicular to this XY plane. The origin of the grounded reference frame is at point O. Attached at point O is a turntable, a disc, which will rotate in the XY plane about the Z axis through point O. And the turntable or disc rotates at a constant angular rate. This is described as the angular velocity of reference frame R1, which is the body fixed coordinate system X1, Y1 with respect to R, and that angular rate, angular velocity, is constant, and we will designate it as simply omega. This is an example of simple angular motion, as the z-axis in the R reference frame and the z1 axis in the R1 reference frame, the body fixed coordinate system, those two ax axes remain parallel throughout the motion. We have simple angular motion. An ant is at point P on the turntable walking at a constant speed V relative to the turntable towards some food at point two. Here is the ant, a distance R from point O initially. The ant sees some food at point two and starts walking at a constant speed V relative to the rotating disk towards the food. The question is, what is the absolute acceleration of the ant? That is, what is the acceleration of the ant that a observer would see fixed the ground? Here is a diagram that shows the situation in a little more detail. Here's the fixed axis of rotation. Here is the ant at position one, a distance r from that fixed axis of rotation. So at time t, the ant is at position one. The ant has a velocity equal to r omega due to the rotation of the disk, but the ant also has a velocity equal to v as the ant is walking at a constant speed on the rotating disk towards the food at two. In time delta t, the ant will move a distance delta r 
equal to V times delta T. But the disk will rotate through an angle delta theta equal to omega times delta T. So at time delta T, as viewed from the ground, the ant is now in position two prime. The ant still has the velocity V relative to the disk, which is constant, but now has a tangential velocity equal to r plus delta r times omega, as the ant has moved farther away from the center of the disk. With this introduction, let us now proceed to determine what is the absolute acceleration of the ant, that is the acceleration of point P, the ant, with respect to the R, the grounded reference frame. Let's now apply our acceleration equation, the acceleration of P in the grounded or R reference frame to the current situation. The first term is the acceleration of O, in the grounded reference frame. O is a point fixed in both R and R1. It's where the fixed axis of rotation is, which is the z-axis. Let's skip to the third term. This includes the angular acceleration of R1 and R. We know that zero because the angular velocity of R1 and R is constant. And this is simple angular velocity and so the angular acceleration of R1 and R is zero. The fourth term, the acceleration of P in R1. P in R1 is the motion of the ant with respect to the rotating turntable. The ant is moving at a constant velocity V, so the acceleration of the ant with respect to the R1 reference frame, or the turntable, is zero. So we are left with the second and fifth terms. If I write the angular velocity of R1 in R, since the rotation is clockwise, and hence in the negative K1 hat direction, I have this term. This gets crossed with the cross product of that term with the position vector from O to P. Position vector from O to P is R, and it's in the J1 hat direction. So I make that substitution into this term, and I get these cross products. The last term, making the substitution for the angular velocity of R1 and R, again the same, minus the quantity angular velocity of R1 and R, in the k1 hat direction, it's minus k1 hat, cross with the velocity of p in r1, which is a constant velocity in the j1 hat direction. The result is that the absolute acceleration of the ant, as viewed from the grounded reference frame, has a component minus r omega squared in the j1 hat direction, so it's in the negative j1 hat direction, plus 2 omega v in the i1 hat direction, which is my Coriolis acceleration. Let's try to understand physically where these terms come from and what they mean. The approximate acceleration of the ant with respect to the R reference frame is the difference between its velocity at points two prime and one divided by delta t. Then we take the limit as delta t goes to zero. The result is the acceleration of p, the ant, as viewed in the grounded reference frame, the r reference frame. This is what we call the absolute acceleration of p. The absolute acceleration of P will be expressed in the XY coordinate system, the grounded reference frame. So let's first consider the Y direction component. We see here that at point one, the Y direction component of the velocity is just V, 
at point two prime, the velocity has two components, V and R plus delta R times omega. The Y component of V is V cosine theta. The Y component of R plus delta R times omega is R plus delta R times omega times the sine of theta. And that's in the minus Y direction. So if I substitute those components into my equation for the Y direction, or what I call here the radial direction, I have components two and four, the Y components of the velocity V and the velocity R plus delta R times omega minus the Y component at one, which is just V. If I substitute, I have V cosine theta minus omega times R plus delta R sine theta, and that whole expression minus V, the velocity in the Y direction at point one. Since I'm letting delta T go to zero, delta theta will get very small using a small angle approximation. Cosine of theta is approximately equal to one. Sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. I simplify this expression. I divide both sides by delta T. And what happens is that the result is that if I take the limit as delta T goes to zero, that absolute acceleration in the y direction, what I call a radial, is minus r omega squared. This is my centripetal acceleration. And there are three observations. The minus r omega squared is just due to term number four shown here in the diagram. V, the velocity, which is the constant velocity of the ant with respect to the disk, has no effect on A radial. However, the centripetal acceleration does depend on R, the ant's position. Now let's consider the acceleration components in the X direction. This is the X direction in the R reference frame. At point one, the component in the X direction is R omega. At point two prime, V has an X component shown here by one, and R plus delta R times omega has an X component shown here by three. So to get delta V tangential, which is what I call the X component, I have the two components one and three added together, minus R omega, the X component at position one. One is the velocity V times the sine of theta. Three is the velocity R plus delta R times omega times the cosine of theta. And from that expression, I subtract R omega. Again, since delta T is going to zero, delta theta will then get very small. And the small angle approximation tells us that cosine theta is approximately equal to one, sine theta is approximately equal to theta. That leads me to this expression. If I divide by delta T and let delta T go to zero, my result is two times omega times velocity. This is my Coriolis acceleration. And there are three observations that I can make. One is the Coriolis acceleration is independent of the ant's position. Two, the effect of omega on V, which is term one, is always exactly the same as the effect of V on omega, which is term three. Lastly, the effect of omega changing the orientation of V is exactly the same as the effect of V carrying R omega to a different radius.
changing its magnitude. I hope this example helps to clarify the meaning of Coriolis acceleration and centripetal acceleration. Here is a 3D rigid body kinematics example you can work on. R is the ground reference frame. R1 is a shaft in simple angular velocity with respect to the R reference frame. Attached to the shaft is a clevis to which is mounted a disc. The disc is the R2 reference frame and it has simple angular velocity in the R1 reference frame. The task is to find the velocity of point P, a point on the disk, in the R reference frame. If R is the ground reference frame, we call this the absolute velocity of point P. And also find the acceleration of P in the R reference frame. Again, if R is the ground reference frame, we call this the absolute acceleration of point P. Angular velocity plays a critical role in determining the angular momentum of a rigid body. Let's talk about linear and angular momentum. In analyzing the dynamics of rigid bodies, it is clearly important to be able to calculate the linear and angular momentum of the rigid body. This is important whether we are using the direct or vector approach or the indirect or energy approach. These depend on the mass distribution properties of the rigid body. That is, the location of the center of mass of the rigid body and the inertia matrix of the rigid body with respect to a set of body fixed axes at a point. It is important that the mass distribution properties calculated are independent of the angular motion of the rigid body. Linear momentum of a rigid body. Shown is the ground reference frame R with coordinate system capital X, capital Y, capital Z. This is rigid body B. Its body fixed axes are small x, small y, small z, with point O as the origin. DM represents a differential mass element of rigid body B. Its position vector with respect to O is given by the vector R. Point C represents the center of mass of rigid body B. Its position vector with respect to O is given by the vector R over bar. And the position vector of DM with respect to point C is given by the vector Rho. The total mass of rigid body B is given by this integral the integral of dm over the body B. And the location of the center of mass is defined by this equation. R over bar equals one over m times the integral over the body B of the vector R times dm. This is the definition of the center of mass location for rigid body B. Let's write an expression for the linear momentum of the rigid body. The linear momentum of the rigid body is the sum of the linear momenta of the differential mass elements. The linear momentum of dm is v times dm. The total linear momentum is the integral over the body b. The velocity v of dm using my kinematics is the velocity of O with respect to R plus, since dm is fixed in body B, the next term is then the angular velocity of B in the R reference frame crossed with the vector R from O to dm.
dm is fixed in body b. This integral is then performed over the body b. Since the velocity of O with respect to the grounded reference frame does not depend on the integral, it can come outside of the integral. Similarly, the angular velocity of body B in the grounded reference frame does not depend on the integral. It can come outside of the integral. I recognize the integral of dm over the body B as the definition of the total mass. And I recognize that the integral of R dm over the body B is m times R over bar. If I make these substitutions and then factor out the common factor m, I see that the velocity of O in the R reference frame plus the angular velocity of B in the R reference frame crossed with R over bar is equal to the mass times the velocity of C in the R reference frame. Hence, we've derived an expression for the linear momentum of the rigid body. The linear momentum of the rigid body is equal to the total mass of the rigid body times the absolute velocity of the center of mass. That is the velocity of C in the R reference frame. Angular momentum of a rigid body. The diagram is the same as shown on the previous slide. This is the ground R reference frame. This is rigid body B with body fixed axes small x, small y, small z, and origin O. dm is a differential mass within the body with position vector R with respect to point O. Angular momentum is the moment of linear momentum. It's represented by the symbol H, which is a vector, and the subscript is the point about which the angular momentum is, is determined. The linear momentum of dm is its velocity times dm, and the moment of the linear momentum is the position vector of dm with respect to O crossed with the velocity of dm times dm, as shown in this expression here. This then is the linear momentum of dm, again where v is the absolute velocity of dm, the velocity with respect to ground. If I want the total angular momentum with respect to point O, I integrate over the body B. I can replace the velocity of dm V by an equivalent kinematic expression. The velocity of dm is the velocity of O with respect to ground, plus the angular velocity of B in R crossed with the position vector of dm with respect to O. That's shown in this expression here. Velocity v is the velocity of O with respect to ground, plus the angular velocity of b with respect to ground, crossed with the position vector from O to dm. I can then take this integral and I can distribute the vector cross product with R over each term. Let's do that, and then let's look at the first term. If I interchange the order of the vector cross product, I then must add a minus sign. The velocity of O with respect to R does not depend on the integral, and so can come outside the integral. So the first term, is equal to minus the velocity of O in the R reference frame cross with the integral of R dm. And the second term we just carry through. This first term will equal zero in two circumstances. If point O is fixed in R, 
then the velocity of O and R is zero. Also, since this expression, the integral of R dm, locates for us the center of mass of body B, since it equals m times r bar, this integral will equal zero if point O coincides with point C, the center of mass. So we've determined that the angular momentum of body B with respect to either a fixed point O or the center of mass is given by either of these integrals, where R is the position vector of dm with respect to fixed point O, and rho is the position vector of dm with respect to the center of mass. Note that angular momentum and also angular velocity is our vectors with a magnitude, each with a magnitude and each with a direction. And depending on the coordinate system we use to express that magnitude and direction, the components will be different, but the magnitude and direction of the vector will not change. It is independent of how we express it, of the coordinate system we use to write the components. Here I've written the angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to point O, which could either be fixed or coincide with the mass center in terms of body fixed axes. So these are body fixed components. Similarly, for the angular velocity of B and R, I've chosen to express that angular velocity in terms of body fixed axes body fixed components. So here again, we assume either point O is fixed in R or coincident with the mass center of the body. So note that the angular momentum and the angular velocity vectors are independent of the orientation of the XYZ body fixed axes, but their components are not. Their components are not independent of the orientation of the body fixed axes. We can show by performing that integration that the body fixed components of the angular momentum vector is related to the body fixed components of the angular velocity vector through the inertia matrix. There are nine terms in the inertia matrix. Only six are independent. Ix is defined by this expression, Iy by this expression, Iz by this expression. And these three are called mass moments of inertia. Ixy equals Iyx, and they're both equal to this expression. Ixz equals Izx, and they're both equal to this expression. Iyz equals Izy, and they're both equal to this expression. Those six terms are called mass products of inertia. Note, the elements of the inertia matrix are for a particular point, either point O or the mass center, and a particular orientation of the XYZ body fixed axes. The inertia matrix describes the way mass is distributed with respect to the selected body fixed coordinate system. So although the rigid body may rotate and translate, the inertia matrix with respect to the body fixed reference frame is invariant with time. If on the other hand, the O, small x, small y, small z axes were to rotate with respect to the body. In general, the inertia matrix would be a function of time, thus introducing significant complexity into the angular momentum calculations. An inertia matrix can be calculated for each point in a rigid body. This is also true for every point outside the body, 
since the fixed origin O need not be inside the body. But our results represent the angular momentum of the rigid body for either any point that is fixed in inertial space or is the center of mass of the rigid body. In three-dimensional rigid body motion, the angular momentum and the angular velocity are generally not parallel, a fact that leads to much of the complexity of rigid body dynamics. The situation simplifies considerably for rigid bodies undergoing plane motion. Suppose in the diagram, a rigid body is being driven at a constant angular velocity about the z-axis as shown. So the, the grounded reference frame, capital X, capital Y, capital Z, and the body fixed axes, small x, small y, small z, coincide at this instant in time. Assume that point O is fixed in inertial space. The angular velocity is directed along the z-axis. So it only has one component, the z component, the angular velocity of b and r in the z direction. The other two components, the x and y co components, are by definition, in this case, zero. The angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to point O, which we say is fixed in inertial space, is given by the matrix multiplication, hx equals ixy times omega z, hy equals iyz times omega z, hz equals iz times omega z, since omega x and omega y are zero. So we see that while the angular velocity vector is in the z direction, the angular momentum vector with respect to point O has x, y, and z components. The translation theorem for angular momentum is another very useful theorem. It says that the angular momentum of a body B about any point P on or off the body fixed or moving, can be expressed as the angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to point P is equal to the moment with respect to point P of the linear momentum of the rigid body, L, plus the angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to its center of mass. To derive this, we start by writing the expression for the angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to point P. dm is a differential mass in the rigid body, r is the position vector of dm with respect to point P. dm has a velocity v. So the angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to point P is the integral of the cross product of r and VDM integrated over the body. I can replace V by its equivalent kinematic expression. The velocity V of dm is the velocity of C with respect to R, plus the angular velocity of B in R crossed with the position vector of dm with respect to C, which is rho. I then can write the position vector r using vector algebra. r is equal to r from p to c plus rho. I make that substitution. Now I can distribute r p c to each of these terms, and I can distribute rho to each of these terms. And so then I will have one, two, three, four terms to evaluate. I see that both the position vector from P to C and the velocity of C and R are independent of the integral. 
they can come outside the integral, and the integral of dm is just m. Then I can see that here, I can remove the velocity of c and r from inside the integral, change the order of the cross product, which will then involve the addition of a minus sign, and the result is shown here, minus the velocity of c and r cross with the integral of rho dm. But rho is the vector that locates dm with respect to the center of mass. So that integral is zero. In the third term, I can remove the position vector from p to c and the angle of velocity of b and r from inside the integral. And then I have, as a result, this expression and I see again that the integral of rho dm equals zero, as rho is the position vector of dm with respect to c. The last term, the integral of rho cross with the angle of velocity of b in r cross with rho is by definition the angular momentum of the body b with respect to its center of mass. And the first term that we have here is the moment of the linear momentum, which is mass times the velocity of c and r, crossed with the position vector from p to c. So it's the moment of the linear momentum with respect to point p, plus the angular momentum of the rigid body with respect to its center of mass. This concludes the presentation on angular velocity of a rigid body. Thank you for your attention.